Santa Fe County DA's office appears to be in what looks like the final steps before they determine whether or not they're going to be charging anyone from the Rust film set shooting incident. Will Alec Baldwin be charged? And if so, what are some of the things that have come out since that shooting incident that would be either hurting him or helping him? Let's get into it. Hey everyone, welcome to Legal Bites. If you're new here, my name is Alita. I'm a lawyer licensed in California and DC, and on this channel, we make sense of the law one bite at a time. So on October 27th, 2022, the Santa Fe County Sheriff's Department handed over its investigative report on the Alec Baldwin rust set shooting incident to the DA's office. According to TMZ, prosecutors in New Mexico tell TMZ, the Santa Fe County Sheriff gave its investigative report on the shooting incident to the DA's office Thursday, who will now begin a, quote, thorough review, unquote, of the evidence before deciding on whether or not to bring criminal charges. The DA may have already shown her hand. As we reported, she recently asked New Mexico for help in financing several potential prosecutions and named Alec as a possible defendant. So it has been widely speculated that if the DA's office does decide to pursue charges of some sort concerning this incident, Alec Baldwin is likely to be one of them. This is not only because Alec Baldwin has repeatedly thrust himself into the public spotlight to talk about what happened, much to the likely chagrin of his lawyers, but also because Santa Fe District Attorney Mary Carmack Altwise named him specifically when talking about the prospect of charging anyone for this incident. From an LA Times article that came out back on September 26, 2022, in a recent letter to the state's finance board, Santa Fe District Attorney Mary Carmack Altwise said as many as four people could face criminal charges in connection with the accident last year that claimed the life of cinematographer Helena Hutchins and injured director Joel Souza. The district attorney said that her office is considering charges including homicide as well as gun violations, the Santa Fe New Mexican reported. One of the possible defendants is well-known movie actor Alec Baldwin, the district attorney wrote in a letter dated August 30th and viewed by the Times. She did not identify other individuals who might be charged. If charges are warranted, the first judicial district attorney anticipates prosecuting up to four individuals. My expenses for the rest case will begin immediately and will be costly, she wrote. As for those charges, the DA requested $635,000 from the state to prepare for potentially four jury trials, saying that that much was needed because she anticipated going up against some very expensive lawyers. And since they were going to need a special investigator, media spokesperson, and experts of several kinds. In the end, the state ended up giving a lot less than that. It was somewhere around $317,000 for the appointment of a special prosecutor to oversee the case. Not long after that, the DA responded by appointing Andrea Reeb as special prosecutor. Ms. Reeb has over 25 years experience working as an attorney in New Mexico's 9th Judicial District Attorney's Office, including serving as a district attorney herself. She's also an adjunct professor who teaches criminal law classes at Clovis Community College. So it looks like by all appearances, no official decision has really been made yet about whether or not they are going to be charging anyone, but there certainly have been some significant movements by the state of New Mexico to prepare for potential criminal charges. And with that, let's turn to some of the things that have come out of this case that are either helpful or hurtful to Alec Baldwin in the event he does get charged. One of the first things that has hurt Alec Baldwin is arguably Alec Baldwin. Since the beginning of this controversy, he's made multiple appearances to the public to talk about the incident, and none of them have helped him in the court of law or the court of public opinion. And by all accounts, he was the one who was holding the loaded revolver in his hand when the incident occurred on October 21st, 2021. He was rehearsing a scene in an old Western church where he's supposed to pull a revolver and aim it. As he pulled the gun out, it fired a bullet which passed through cinematographer Helena Hutchins and struck directly director Joel Souza. Hutchins died and Souza was injured. According to Alec Baldwin, in a sit-down interview that was conducted on December 1st, 2021 with ABC's George Stephanopoulos, he said, Everything is in her direction. She's guiding me through how she wants me to hold the gun for this angle. And I, I draw the gun out and I find a mark. I draw the gun out and I find a cut. Baldwin and gave a detailed the explanation of how the gun, the gun went off. He says without him pulling the trigger. So you have this cold 45, you just pulled 
the hammer as far back as I go without cocking the actual. And you're holding on to the hammer. I'm holding that. I'm just showing. I go, how about that? Does that work? Do you see that? Do you see that? Do you see that? She goes, yeah, that's good. I let go of the hammer. Bang, the gun goes. Now, from every perspective, this interview was bad. From a publicity perspective, it looked a lot like Alec Baldwin was shifting the blame from himself to anyone and everyone else, including Helena Hutchins herself, for allegedly instructing him to point the gun at her. And legally speaking, Alec Baldwin made a series of admissions that basically pieced together every single point from him taking, picking up, pointing, and shooting the gun at Helena Hutchins. The only thing missing from this whole situation coming out of that interview was a question as to whether the gun was working properly or whether there was some sort of a malfunction that would explain it going off on its own. Which brings us to our next point that is very bad for Alec Baldwin, and that is the FBI's report on that revolver. Early on in the investigation, it was reported that the Federal Bureau of Investigation was taking the revolver to run tests on it to see if it had somehow malfunctioned. If there was a malfunction, that would effectively eliminate a potential criminal charge against Baldwin, since he apparently had few touch points with the gun before its appearance in this scene. And while the FBI took quite a while to complete its report, there were quite a few firearms experts in the meantime who came forward to speak out about the essentially the impossibility of a revolver of that type to just go off on its own. Not plausible. On a single action revolver, when you pull the hammer back, which is an intentional act, click, 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 click. Now the hammer is set. When you pull the hammer back and let go, as you can see, I'm not holding this, you know, the hammer doesn't go anywhere. When you press the trigger, which is, I'm gonna do it with this finger so you can see what a minute act that is takes very little to press the trigger there. So option one, you know, he pressed the trigger, but it was such a minor press that, that, it, that he wasn't aware that he had, you know, ordered that signal from his brain. Or option B, he's holding the gun with the trigger depressed. Now, on this gun, it doesn't matter which order you go in. You can either cock the gun and you can fire it with the trigger, or you can press the gun, the trigger, and then cock the gun. And if you release it at this point, it falls and the gun fires. So if as he is cross drawing, his finger is on the trigger, which he may have interpreted as just resting on the trigger, but with a one millimeter pull, that would be sufficient. Now he pulls the hammer back and then releases it. He doesn't have to press the trigger again if he's already got pressure on it in order for the gun to fire. And I think that's really a, a key point in this, in this matter. So generally speaking, by the time the FBI came out with its report, the public largely expected to see confirmation of this logic, that there was essentially no way for that gun to have gone off without Alec Baldwin pulling the trigger. And on August 12, 2022, that is exactly what came out of this report. From ABC News, accidental discharge testing determined that the firearm used in the shooting, a 45 Colt single action revolver, could not have fired without the trigger being pulled, the FBI report shows. With the hammer in the quarter and half cock positions, the gun could not be made to fire without a pull of the trigger, the report said. With the hammer fully cocked, the gun could not be made to fire without a pull of the trigger while the working internal components were intact and functional, the report stated. With the hammer decocked on a loaded chamber, the gun was able to detonate a primer without a pull of the trigger when the hammer was struck directly, which is normal for this type of revolver, the report stated. Now, even with this report's conclusion, I should mention with all fairness to Baldwin's side that Baldwin's attorney, Luke Nickus, responded to the public that he thought that the FBI report was being misconstrued. The gun fired in testing only only one time without having to pull the trigger when the hammer was pulled back and the gun broke in two different places. The FBI was unable to fire the gun in any prior test, even when pulling the trigger, because it was in such poor condition. And on top of that, Mr. Nickus pointed to the medical examiner's report concerning Helena Hutchins' manner of death, which is a point that is more helpful to Alec Baldwin in this case. So let's talk about that for a second. On August 15th, 2022, just a few days after the FBI came out with its report on that revolver, the Santa Fe County Medical Examiner also came out with its report. In it, the medical examiner gave a conclusion as to the manner of death of Helena Hutchins. Now, before I get into specifics about the medical examiner's report, let me get into some details about manner of death here. When we talk about manner of death, it's different from cause of death. Cause of death refers to a specific injury that led 
led to the death of someone. As an example, blunt force trauma to the head or a gunshot wound to vital organs would be considered a cause of death. Manner of death, on the other hand, is a determination of how an injury leads to someone's death. There are five manners of death that will show up on a final report from a medical examiner. Those are natural death, accident, suicide, homicide, and undetermined. Natural death means a death that is solely caused by disease or natural process. If a natural death is hastened by injury, the manner of death is not going to be considered natural. An accident is defined as an unnatural death resulting from an inadvertent chance happening. For example, traffic related fatalities are generally classified as accidents. The same is true for deaths related to illicit drug or excessive medication use, so long as there's no evidence supporting a homicide or a suicide. Suicide refers to someone's death from a self-inflicted injury with evidence of intent to die. This kind of evidence includes something like explicit expression, like a suicide note or a verbal threat, previous attempts, or some act constituting implicit intent. Homicide is where the action of one person directly causes the death of another. Although homicide is also a legal term, when used in this way on a medical examiner's report, the definition is limited to a strict causal medical definition and is not supposed to be used as a legal determination. In other words, it's not meant to be used to conclude that someone has committed a homicide in a legal sense. Examples of deaths that are determined to be homicides include when a person dies while a felony is being committed or some kind of purposeful action. But keep in mind that there doesn't need to be a proven intent to cause death for the classification to be homicide. And finally, the last one, undetermined is a label for cases that have very little information about the circumstances surrounding the death or where there's known information, but it equally supports and conflicts more than one manner of death. In the case of the rust shooting, the Santa Fe County Medical Examiner's report was likely to label Helena Hutchins death either as an accident or as a homicide. In other words, inadvertent chance versus one person's directly causing the other's death. And this is where things can get a little bit tricky because whether this was an accident or a homicide is kind of also an ultimate legal question in a case like this. So where a medical examiner makes a decision between designating a death as an accident or a homicide, they really have the ability to impact a potential legal outcome even though in a trial that's ultimately a question that's left to the jury. And here, the medical examiner concluded that Helena Hutchins' death was actually an accident, pure chance. And there's definitely disagreement out there on that, especially given the FBI report on the revolver and the opinions of many firearms experts on how that kind of a revolver works. In fact, I'm sure that you have thoughts on it. If you do, let us know in the comments down below. But as for Baldwin's legal team, they argue that this supports the idea that this was just some freak accident and that Baldwin shouldn't be charged. And if this goes to trial, this is something that we can expect the defense to use as vigorously as possible in defending the case. And that leads me to my final point in this video, which is one that Baldwin's team is likely to use, and that's the nature of how this shooting came about. As I said before, all of this happened on a film set. Baldwin is the one with the gun in hand when it fired, but there wasn't supposed to be a live round in the chamber because it was a film set. This is one thing that Baldwin's team has used many times to argue that he's not responsible, and it's something that could legitimately stand in the way of the DA's prosecution of a case like this. Now, talking about the revolver specifically, this was a prop gun. And when I say that, I'm not suggesting that this was not in some way a real firearm. It absolutely very much was, as prop guns typically are. But when the gun is a prop gun, it's under the responsibility of the film production's prop department, and specifically the armorer. In this case, that was Hannah Gutierrez-Reed. She's the one who bears responsibility for caring for, maintaining, and ensuring the safety of all firearms and munitions on set. Before any gun is handed to an actor for a particular scene, she's supposed to check the gun in front of the actor, make sure it doesn't have any live rounds in it, and then hand it to the actor, verbalizing that she's checked it and that it's safe. Unfortunately, what happened here is, for one reason or another, Gutierrez Reed was not there to take the gun from the prop cart or to check to see if it was safe and certainly wasn't there to hand it to Alec Baldwin. Instead, the assistant director, David Halls, took it from the prop cart and handed it to Baldwin, telling him it was safe. There are a lot of questions about how much David Halls actually checked the revolver to see if it was safe, but he certainly didn't do it in front of Alec Baldwin if he did it at all. So really, the question becomes, who's really responsible here? 
Is it Gutierrez Reed? Is it Halls? Is it Baldwin? Arguably, it was Gutierrez Reed's responsibility to make sure that the gun was kept safe. She was the armorer on set, after all. But at the same time, it was Halls' responsibility to make sure he allowed the armorer to do her job instead of interfering with a very important safety protocol. And as far as Baldwin is concerned, he has a long career history of filming movies that involve the use of firearms. So his experience is likely to come into play here because he should know to expect a certain safety protocol to take place here. If he's handed a firearm on set by anyone other than the armorer, that should call into question the safety of the firearm. To put it simply, when it comes to firearms, he can't just assume that other people are being safe when something's out of place like that. And on top of all of that, he also is one of the executive producers for the film. And with that, undoubtedly comes a certain level of responsibility that someone who's just an actor wouldn't have. Even still, I would expect Baldwin's legal team to make a very big argument about some shared responsibility between Halls and Gutierrez Reed, maybe even others, and that he's really not responsible for being the one to check the gun in the first place. So looking at everything here, is it a slam dunk case against Alec Baldwin? No, not really. But is it a solid defense for Baldwin? No. Definitely not. In my opinion, if the Santa Fe County DA chooses to prosecute this case, there's plenty that they can use to make a good case against Baldwin, but it wouldn't be without its own challenges. But those are my thoughts. What do you think? Let us know in the comments down below. Otherwise, I hope you enjoyed this or at least found it informative. And if you did, I would love it if you could hit the like button. It does help us with the YouTube algorithm gods. And if you wanna see more content like this and you haven't done so already, be sure to hit the subscribe button and the notification bell so you can find out when the next video is uploaded. See you in the next one.